Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Michigan Engineering DEI lecture. I'm Sarah Pozzi. I'm a professor of nuclear engineering and director of diversity, equity, and inclusion for the College of Engineering. The DEI lectures are an important part of our people first engineering. We're committed to engaging our entire community, learning and growing together. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Professor Nick Hamrickson is an associate professor of Spanish linguistics in LFNA and an advanced faculty fellow. He earned a bachelor's degree in Spanish and math from Rutgers University, a master's degree in Hispanic linguistics from Indiana University, and his doctorate in linguistics and Hispanic linguistics from Indiana University. He was awarded the UM New Instruction New Initiative Grant for the project Integrating Gender Diverse Language into the Romance Curriculum for 2022 to 2024. So please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Nick Hamrickson. Nick, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Sarah, for that really nice uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. I'm going to share my screen first here. OK, so I'm assuming that everybody can hear and see me OK. Looks great. Thank right. you. Thanks so much, Sarah. So as Sarah mentioned, <clears throat> my name is Nick Henriksen. I use he, him pronouns in English, uh, el in Spanish. I'm an associate professor in the departments of Romance Languages and Literatures and Linguistics with an LSNA. Um, and for 2022, 2023, I'm really excited to be working with ADVANCE as a faculty fellow, and my undertaking during the fellowship period has been to develop the materials for today's event, which I hope you enjoy. So here you have a little bit more information about me with an overview of the different roles that I hold on campus. I am currently in my fourth year serving as, an associ as the associate chair of my home department of Romance Languages and Literatures, and also co-direct the speech production lab there. With respect to my areas of DEI work, I serve in my home department's gender diversity committee and also collaborate with ADVANCE and SPECTRUM, the SPECTRUM Center here at U of M, to facilitate the talk that you're attending today. Um, it's really important for me to express how grateful I feel for the guidance that I've received over the course of the past few months, year, um, from colleagues both at ADVANCE and SPECTRUM. Um, as I've been piloting today's materials. Um, I would like to thank the colleagues who are here today from Spectrum in advance for the guidance that they've received. Thank you again. So we're gonna start today's lecture with a 30 second thought exercise, uh, just to open space for reflection and to sort of bring us into the moment of, of today's talk. I won't ask for responses afterward. Um, this is just sort of part of the personal work that we all do. So here's the, the prompt. It says, it asks to spend 30 seconds reflecting on the following two questions. First, how do you know what your gender identity is? And second, what gender cues do you use? Um, with respect to gender cues, some examples might be clothing decisions, hair length, names, pronouns, etc. So I'll give everybody here about 30 seconds to reflect on those two questions, and then we'll come back and move on. Okay, so I understand that very likely your thinking might have gone to many different places while you were reflecting on those two questions um, in the prompt there. For me personally, uh, my thinking about gender and gender identity makes me realize how easy it is for me as a cisgender male to signal my identity, right? And it's also pushed me to reflect on the privilege that I hold um, as a cisgender male and to also develop uh, materials like today's lecture that advocate for communities at the margins, such as trans members and non-binary members of, of our campus community. So more to that point, you know, what brings me here today as the person giving uh, this lecture? Uh, first, um, 
Openly trans and non-binary students and colleagues on campus have shared stories of a lack of acceptance and even unfortunately discrimination due to their identities. Um, and you know, that is unfortunately, it's, 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 it's really hard to hear sometimes those stories. Um, and as an ally, I want to support them the best way possible. By the way, um, with respect to the words, the terms ally and allyship, I understand that anybody can be an ally with respect to embracing and advocating for diverse communities on campus. On that note, um, I aim to use my privilege as a cisgender member of the LGBTQIA plus community to advocate for the voices of trans and non-binary individuals. You know, so in other words, I envision today's lecture as a way of sort of interrupting the cisgenderism prevalent in society and also on campus, which advocates privilege and power to cisgender identities while creating barriers, you know, personal, professional, legal for those that are not. And finally, um, adv advocacy for LGBTQIA plus inclusivity is an urgent workplace issue, um, both in higher education and broad, more broadly in society. And we'll talk more about that last point uh, later on. So here are three primary objectives driving today's lecture. Um, first, I would like to raise awareness around the urgency and need to develop a more trans and non-binary inclusive culture in UM's campus community. Second, we will aim through the lecture to achieve a common understanding of terms that are useful when talking about sex, gender, and the trans and non-binary communities on campus. We'll do this through um, a review of vocabulary terms and a couple of practice exercises. And finally, I'd like for us to collectively develop strategies and skills for promoting a more trans and non-binary inclusive campus culture. Um, we'll use the chat function for that a little bit later on, and hopefully we'll be able to generate some, some informative and positive and enlightening uh, responses. So we'll move on to the first portion of today's lecture, now, raising awareness around the urgency to develop a more trans and non-binary inclusive culture on our campus community. And an important question here that we want to keep in mind is, you know, how are trans and non-binary individuals treated in the workplace? How does this result in career satisfaction? In the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey, completed by more than 25,000 respondents, more than three quarters of the respondents who had, a, who had had a job in the previous year took steps to avoid mistreatment, such as hiding or delaying their gender transition or even quitting their job. With respect to higher education, 67% um, of trans and non-binary graduate students have expressed safety concerns, with many sharing that they remain worried that their trans and or non-binary status might invite rejection, ridicule, or even violence on campus communities. Takeaway here from these two data points is that you know, trans and non-binary individuals often don't feel safe enough to come out to colleagues in the workplace. And critically, the safety concern uh, can lead to resignation and, and frequent mental health issues. A second question is, that, that commonly gets asked uh, is what is the current population of openly trans and non-binary individuals? While we don't have information for all members of UM's campus community, we do know that 24% of U of M of U of M students identify as LGBTQ+. Um, for staff, the number is 12%. For faculty, the number is, is 10%. So that's a pretty sizable portion of, the, of our, of our um, undergraduate as well as staff and faculty members of, of campus who identify you know, broadly as LGBTQ+. At the national level, with respect to trans and non-binary demographics, 5.1% of adults younger than 30, that is 30 and lower, are openly trans or non-binary, while 0.5% of those 50 are, are of those who are 50 and older identify as openly trans or non-binary. By the way, uh, in the UM 2021 Faculty Climate Report, this number was 1.6%. So the takeaway here is that while we may not see a large trans and non-binary identifying population now in the composition of U of, U of, M, U of M's faculty, it's definitely going to increase 
in light of the numbers from the younger generations. So promoting gender inclusivity is urgent, not only for the present, but also definitely for the future. Um, you know, by the way, I think it's important just to, to, to reference here this 0.5%. Um, the percentage of trans non-binary folks who are 50 and older is probably much higher. It's probably closer to 5.1% that we see on the national level. Um, but these individuals may use other words to describe themselves or regrettably are closeted because of the errors that they grew up in. So it's important to keep that point, that point in mind. Okay, so let's move on to some qualitative data to understand the trans and non-binary experience from a different angle. Here we have a quote in an article about graduate students' experiences in higher education. Um, it's sort of a tough art, it's sort of a tough, a tough quote to get through, but it is sort of revealing. I'll read it out loud here. Faculty members would often misgender me when speaking to each other about me. Oh, she did so much this week, or to me, you go girl. Despite the fact that I had introduced myself to and in front of them several times with my pronouns and had worn a large pin indicating those pronouns. It always felt like a kick in the gut, like they didn't care about or respect me. And like they do not care about trans students despite their vocal assurance to do so. I usually do not say anything because I do not because I had seen one of them grade my peers lower on assignments after they disagreed with her in class. I felt unsafe correcting someone who could and would likely seek some sort of vengeance. The takeaway here from this quote is that trans and non-binary graduate students suffer from misgendering every day. While its negative impact on mental health is deeper than we can imagine, uh, behind the desire to correct others often lies further safety concerns, which we're trying to mitigate through today's uh, lecture, presentation today. One more quote that I find compelling from an article about trans educators and professors is the following. I'll read it out loud here. I feel vulnerable when I talk about being a trans person who studies trans things. I worry that others will interpret my work as some sort of self-serving mental activity to make my own reality become even more intelligible. Perhaps put more simply, I worry that I am not enough, that I do not write well enough, and that my transness is not visible enough. In this incessant worrying of being enough, I worry that I come up short with too little explanation, too little experience. So the, the takeaway here from this last quote is that while yes, professional anxieties of, and feelings of imposterism are common in all domains of our profession, those who identify as trans and non-binary are hit harder because of the harsh marginalization of their gender identity within our profession, within academia. So with this background, I hope to have engendered a sense of urgency within you um, in light of those you know, quantitative and qualitative uh, data points if it already wasn't present. And thus wanted to move on to the second portion of today's event, where we will achieve a common understanding of terms that are useful when talking about sex, gender, and the trans and non-binary uh, communities. So here we have a list of vocabulary items. Um, in order to talk about what can be seen as, what can be viewed as tricky terms, such as sex, gender, and gender identity, I think it's always very valuable to brush up on their definitions as well as the terms that we use, which are by nature fluid. Um, so here are 10 terms that I chose from the Spectrum Center's Gender 101 handout, because I know that they are very common in discourse and can sometimes cause confusion. I'll just read them out loud here. Uh, biological sex, sex assigned at birth, gender expression, gender identity, attractionality, cisgender, transgender, gender nonconforming, non-binary, and neo-pronoun. So, um, so Michelle, feel free to drop the, the this exercise in the PDF, the, the Google link into the chat, right? What I'll encourage you all to do, this is again, time for you all to do some work um, on your own, right? Is to spend one to two minutes, probably about 60 seconds I'll give you all, looking over this vocabulary exercise and matching the terms on the top of the list with the definitions on the bottom, right? So we'll, we'll be dropping the same document in the chat. And importantly, there are two sides to the document, right? The first side is what you see here, right? With sort of the matching exercise, right? 
On the second side, the second page, you, you have all the answers highlighted in yellow. So you can engage with this document in one of two ways. You can try doing the matching on your own, right? And then checking your answers, or you can read over the responses on the second side of the document as a way of sort of acclimating yourselves to the terms. So I'll give you all about 60 seconds to do this. Um, if you have specific questions, feel free to, to put them into the chat. I'll be monitoring that in case you want me to answer, to address any of them sort of you know right now in the moment. If you have broader questions that you want, you would like me to respond to at the end of the, of the lecture, you can put those into the Q&A, right? So specific questions related to this, this activity in the chat, broader questions for after the lecture, for the last 20 minutes or so in the Q&A. So 60 seconds begin now. Okay. All right. So um, hopefully you have time to engage with, that, with the activity. If not, you can also do it uh, offline afterwards. Um, here you have the responses. This is page two of the document that is that was dropped into the chat. Um, probably uh, the biggest point that I'd emphasize here is the difference between sex and gender. The, we have the former referring to biological attributes and the latter referring to a deep-seated internal sense of gender, which we know is fluid. Um, the last point on the, the last term on the list, uh, neo pronoun, is very relevant for the pronoun practice that we'll be doing on the next few slides. Um, I would indicate that you know she, he, they are typically considered uh, traditional pronouns, which are different from neo or newly created pronouns such as z here or even z here. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a table of pronouns, um, both traditional pronouns and neo pronouns, both with respect to direct address and indirect address that can be used in English to signal gender identity. Before showing you the table, I would highlight two cautionary points. First, this table is not exhaustive, right? There are many other pronouns avail available for use that regrettably, I don't have time or space to talk about today. I will give you a list of references afterward that we'll drop in the chat that you can access later on if you want to know more about neo pronouns or other pronouns, for example. Second, the table that you will see is based on common practices as of you know, April 5th, 2023. Language and society are always changing and, evol and evolving, and it's important to keep that in mind. Sorry, it's important to keep in mind that language changes, right? And that we need to kind of keep up and brush up uh, over time. So with those two sort of caveats in mind, we can go into and look at this uh, pronoun table, right? With some pronouns that can be used in English to signal gender identity. Looking at the table first, I would point out a really important difference between direct address and indirect address, right? And here we have binary pronouns used in direct address. She, her, he, him, nothing new here, right? As well as non-binary pronouns used in direct address, such as they, them, and z, here. 10 to 15 years ago, like the neo pronouns Z here were surely more common to signal non binary identity than maybe they are today. Nowadays, we know that they has become more frequent to signal non binary identity uh, through direct address, but it's certainly not the default. That being said, let me speak a little bit more about they because I know a lot of questions get asked about they, and I know that a lot of the questions that came in through uh, the Zoom invite were about they. Um, you know, right now in 2023, singular non-binary they is very common, and that's likely be, that's likely because they is already well established in English grammar as a generic singular pronoun, right? So it's a singular generic pronoun. We think about the sentence, for example, you know, 
a swimmer needs to get their sleep the night before a competition, that use of they there, it's singular, but also generic, right? Um, it's very common to use that type of, of, of utterance in, in English, and we all do it many instances, you know, over the course of discourse and conversation. That's, of course, generic singular they, which likely serves as a baseline from which to use singular they in the non-binary sense, referring to a specific individual, right? So um, I think we can sort of differentiate those two uses of they, right? The singular generic they, that has been very common in English for centuries, uh, which is different from uh, singular they used in the non-binary sense referring to a specific individual. If someone clearly communicates to you that their pronouns are they, them, or you know, Z here, for example, the most respectful thing to do is to use those pronouns, right? Even if it might, might, might not be uncomfortable for you or new for you at first, right? Um, practice always helps. We'll do a little bit more of that uh, in the next few slides, but I think it's really important to communicate that the most respectful thing to do is to use those pronouns, especially if somebody is asking you or, or indicating that those, that those are their pronouns. Okay, so this, these are pronouns used in direct address. Um, this is very different from indirect address, right? Uh, indirect address, uh, where somebody prefers that speakers refer to them by name only, right? This has been very common. Um, this is very common uh, and has become more prevalent uh, over the course of the pandemic and Zoom. Zoom sort of made this a common practice or the folks who who don't use pronouns uh, commonly used started to include, you know, no pronoun, no pronouns or name only in their Zoom signatures. And um, and if you don't know somebody's pronoun and are proactively trying to avoid misgendering your colleagues or students, name only or no pronouns is a great option. Um, it involves sometimes a little bit of circumlocution, but it also works really well. Um, in addition to um, using uh, the name only option for for folks who who don't use pronouns or prefer to use their name only in the third person. Okay, so that's the pronoun table, right? Direct address, indirect address. You have some binary pronouns, non-binary pronouns. These three are considered typically traditional pronouns, neo-pronouns. Lot to get through there. We'll do some practice now. Okay, so we'll have three practice exercises. Um, here we have a new colleague named Jordan who uses they, them pronouns. So I would invite you all to take about 15 seconds to complete this fill in the blank exercise, right? You can think to yourselves how you'd refer to Jordan when speaking about Jordan in the third person to other colleagues on campus. You're welcome to jot down your responses, pen and paper, write your responses, you know, on, on in Microsoft Word, for example, or in notes on your devices, or if you're willing, Feel free to send the responses through the chat. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat, right? And and um, and looking to see what the responses are. Um, I will, of course, you know, not indicate the names of the folks who are responding in the chat, but if you are eager to get your responses through to me, I'll be looking at them through the chat, right? So 15 seconds begins now, uh, and I'll be back to you soon. Okay, yes, all right, so we've got um, their, they, them. Okay, great, thank you. So Jordan is the new administrative, uh, administrative specialist. In their free time, they enjoy outdoor activities and reading. For them, for Jordan, an inclusive workplace is very important. Thank you to those who responded, appreciate it. Okay, we'll go on to the second pronoun practice. Here we have Nakia, who uses she and they pronouns. So, I'll give you a moment to think about how you might refer to Nikia using this fill in the blank passage. And for this one, I'll give you 20 seconds, which begin now.
Okay, great. Great to see those responses. Okay. So here you have one possible response. Um, Nikia has taught at U of M for 10 years. She loves teaching and many students hear good things about her. In addition to teaching, they also lead reading groups in their department to discuss new research topics, right? So here we're dealing with um, somebody who uses uh, two sets of pronouns, right? And it's important to mention here that the use of multiple pronoun sets is very common among people exploring non-binary identity. We want to be able to respect that. At the same time, it can also be a, per a personal preference for those who feel affirmed by their interlocutors using both pronoun sets. And I've noticed actually, by looking at the responses here, many of the folks who, who responded used both pronoun sets as well as Nikia's first name, including the activity, which is something that, that I would do. Um, you know, so when we see that a colleague or a student or somebody that we know um, includes both pronoun sets, you know, it never hurts to ask personal preference. Um, if, if you have the, the opportunity and space to do that, and if you feel comfortable doing that. Um, I've also included a link here, right? I'll, I'll share it later in the references document. It's a great article though, about, resp about respecting individuals whose multiple sets of pronouns uh, exist and sort of how to interact with them. Um, in my personal experience, you know, when, when, uh, when dealing with folks who use mul multiple sets of pronouns, if it's not possible for me to ask beforehand what their personal preference is, um, I found that it has been very validating for them for me to sort of use uh, both sets of pronouns at different parts of discourse, sort of as I've done here, right? Um, using she, her pronouns and part of the discourse and then they, their and the other part. It can be very validating for folks. Um, at the same time, if it is possible to ask, I encourage you to ask um, because that's always um, the recommended strategy here. Okay, one more. Here we have Harper who uses Z here pronouns and we'll give you about 15 to 20 seconds to complete that one. Feel free to drop your responses in the chat if you have the opportunity or if you feel like doing so. Otherwise, you can jot down your responses on pen and paper or on your devices. All right, so Harper is a specialist librarian at the UM Library. Z loves playing soccer with here friends on weekends. Z also enjoys sewing. Once Z, maybe even Harper here, made a really cool sweater for herself. Um, by the way, I'm including a reference below here. Also, it'll be included in the references document that we'll share at the end of the of the lecture um, with a great resource on the use of neo pronouns in English. Um, the takeaway from that article, if you don't know if you don't have time to read it, is that as one's pronouns are ultimately a reflection of their own personal identity, um, the number and types of neo pronouns a person may use uh, is limitless. And you know, keeping that in mind, it's really important to respect that and to use the pronouns that, that they have let us know, communicated to us that they use. And thank you again for all those great responses. All right, wonderful. I really enjoy seeing the chat. Great to see that we can still be interactive here, even though we're doing a Zoom webinar. Okay, all right. Moving on to the third part of today's lecture. We're gonna now think about strategies and skills for promoting a more trans and inclusive, I'm sorry, and non-binary inclusive campus culture. All right, so first, uh, before going to, into some case studies, we'll uh, explore what I call to be very useful sort of in the moment strategies when interacting with colleagues and students who themselves are trans or non-binary or when speaking about trans or non-binary individuals uh, on campus, All right? The first strategy is to ask. If an individual doesn't express their pronoun, it's always encouraged to ask. If that's something that you don't feel as comfortable doing, you can also introduce yourself with your own pronouns and then make a less pressuring inquiry such as, would it be okay if I ask, what pronouns do you use? So first, ask. Second, a really great strategy here is to mirror the language. Listen carefully to how other people describe themselves or how others describe other members of the campus community, their identity, 
on how they prefer to be referred to. Use the language that they use instead of what you think is correct. I think that's a really, really important uh, point to mention here. Mirroring, lang mirroring language is, is really critical. Third, quick correct. Um, and I know from personal experience that it can be intimidating when you're learning new ways of referring to other people and it's normal to make mistakes. When you do make a mistake, um, the best suggestion here is to correct yourself immediately, quickly apologize and move on. That's a really, really great strategy. So the first was ask, mirror the language, quick correct. And finally, one that I really do like is to make explicit reference to an individual's pronouns. So when you're talking about someone who you know is comfortable using their pronouns publicly, right? Maybe for example, they've included those pronouns on, on a pin or uh, in their email signature or on their name tag on their door. Reference their pronouns after the first mention of them as a way of informing your interlocutors and proactively avoiding misgendering. So for example, in the case of Nikia, for example, maybe if I'm referring to Nikia in a, in a faculty meeting with new members of the faculty, I might say Nikia, who goes by she, he, pro, I'm sorry, who goes by she, who goes by she, they pronouns told me that X, Y, X, Y, Z. And that way, this is a signal to other members of the community that when they refer to Nikia in the future, they can use she or they pronouns. Again, we do this when we know that somebody um, is comfortable uh, sharing their pronouns publicly, and then we can proactively avoid misgendering by, by sig signaling this to, to our interlocutors, to other members of the campus community. Okay, those are sort of four in the moment strategies, which I find to be very useful. Here we also have two more general or broader strategies that help to foment a more gender inclusive campus community, right, at a more general level. First, be proactively inclusive. You can do this by expressing your pronouns in your own email signature, door name tag, website, or CV. This really indicates uh, your allyship and indicates that you understand the importance of communicating gender identity and signaling that. Um, here's an example, for example, uh, of somebody who uses uh, she pronouns as well as they pronouns. Within your own home department or your home unit, you might also consider proposing a working group in your department to build recognition for gender diverse colleagues and students. Um, this is really important at the local level, right? Um, this is actually part of the work that I have been involved in in my home department uh, of Romance Languages and Literatures. Right. And our work recently led me and a team of colleagues to develop a public awareness campaign that highlights the use of non-binary language in the five Romance languages that we teach in our department. So some non-binary pronouns are indicated here. I know some of you might not speak the languages, but I think the, the, the more important part is that we were able to sort of come together and realize that at the, at the departmental level, there was a need to indicate to other instructors, other faculty, other staff and students that non-binary language and non-binary pronouns do exist. Right, and here they are in you know Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, and Catalan, as well as inflectional morphology. Right, and so this can be really, really important at the local level, right, within your own department. The second, uh, more general strategy, is to brush up. Uh, the conversation is fluid. It's really important to stay informed. Um, YouTube searches internet searches, listen to the voices of trans and non-binary individuals um, who have YouTube videos, who write about this, who blog about this. Um, in addition to that, I would definitely recommend checking out the readings on Advance's website, as well as watching a really, really great and really well done web course that was prepared by Spectrum. It was launched in fall 2022. Um, it's also, this link is also included in the references section that I'll, that I'll, that I'll be dropping later on. Um, but Brushing up is really key. It really, really is important. I cannot emphasize how important it is um, in light of the fact that language changes, society changes, um, levels of acceptance change over time. And so the more that you're able to sort of keep up and brush up, the better that we all are. And the more, and the more inclusive our campus community will be. All right, so we had four in the moment strategies, two general strategies. And now we'll move on to case studies. This is the last part portion of the talk of the event before we get into Q&A. So this is a Zoom webinar. 
So it's not possible to work collectively, obviously, um, but I would encourage you to reflect on the two case studies that, that I will present to you. Write down your thoughts. You can do that on pen and paper, on personal devices, or if you would like to send me your responses to the chat function, right? Um, and I'm happy to read, read aloud some of those anonymously afterward. Okay, here we go. First case study. You are the chair of a search committee in your department, in your home department, and you're about to lead an interview with between the committee members and an applicant. Even though the applicant doesn't express their pronouns on their CV or in their email signature, for example, some letters of recommendation use they, while others use he pronouns. So two questions to think about. Do you think you should ask? Number one, and number two, what do you think you can do to make the candidate and your colleagues feel comfortable during the interview, right? So you are the chair, you're in a leadership position, right? You've, you've seen that there are some differences in the way that recommenders are referring to this candidate. Some use he, some use they, what can you do? All right, I will give you all about 60 seconds to think about this. What would you do given this, given this uh, opportunity? Feel free to, if you would like, if you feel comfortable sharing your responses, through the chat, I'll check them out here and uh, we'll come back in about 60 seconds. I have about 30 seconds here. These are some really great responses in the chat. I really appreciate those who are responding. This is wonderful. Okay, so here we have some sample responses, right? Uh, most most folks who have responded uh, have sort of uh, mentioned this, right? Just mention, hi, my name is, state your name. I use these pronouns. Can you please introduce yourself? Um, feel free to let us know your, your pronouns if you're comfortable doing so, right? Um, that's one strategy. Um, uh, another uh, strategy that, I, that I'm seeing here in the chat uh, that this is the one that I haven't actually seen before, which is really cool. It says you can private message them since it might be intimidating to be questioned in front of people who have power over your future. That's That seems really great. Um, uh, most folks are saying introduce yourself, introduce with your own pronouns and asking others to introduce themselves doing the same way, uh, doing, doing, doing the same, um, using the same strategy. Um, and so I think those are all great uh, strategies. Another uh, is that you might also um, in the application form, right? Let's say, for example, or in the interview um, application form or the, the, the list of, every, of, of of the interview schedule, right? Let's say a staff member in your department is, is, is organizing the interview, candidate's name, time of interview. You might also have include in the Google form, the candidates uh, have them, the, give them the opportunity to include their pronouns, right? Sort of proactively, sort of, you know, avoid this sort of, um, uh, you know, maybe what can be seen as an uncomfortable situation. Um, I think we also have to set, our, set up ourselves for the possibility that that the applicant just might not share their pronouns, right? Because um, that does happen as well, right? Um, if that were the case, you know, I would strongly suggest referring to the candidate using their name only or using, you know, gender neutral they when referring to them. And I understand that some of you might be thinking, oh, well, you know, in an interview, you typically use you. That is true, right? But afterward, right, when you're talking about the candidate, um, you want to make sure that you are number one respecting their pronouns if they've indicated that to them, if they've indicated those to you, or um, you know uh, not misgendering them and using name only or they as a way of of avoiding misgendering. In either case, these are really great responses. Okay, great. Okay, all right, wonderful. Okay, we're gonna have to move on to case study number two. All right. You're at a faculty meeting or a staff meeting, student meeting, where the topic of conversation is the progress of this year's new graduate student cohort. 
Some colleagues comment about the generational shifts that they're seeing between the graduate students of yesteryear and the new students, that is the new incoming students. The conversation shifts toward the topic of gender identity and one faculty member comments that they don't feel comfortable using they as a singular person reference because it's grammatically incorrect. What might you say? How might you intervene? Okay, so case study number two, I'll give you about 60 seconds to think about this, reflect about this. If you would like to respond in the chat, feel free to do so, and I'll be sort of monitoring the responses as well. Okay, thinking time, here we go. Okay. All right. These are really great responses. Um, uh, yeah, I really like uh, the, the sort of the variety of and the, the diversity of approaches people are taking. So I'll first just, just look at uh, what I've listed here and then maybe reference a couple of things that were mentioned in the chat. Okay. So yeah, emphasize the importance of respecting and affirming gender identity, right? Um, this is a, a workplace issue, right? We want to uh, engender and foment uh, career satisfaction, um, success at all levels of, of what we do on campus. And affirming someone's identity is, is extremely important, uh, both to respecting them and to also you know, ensuring their success. Um, I would also explain the importance of mirroring language as a way of creating that welcoming inclusive, and inclusive environment. And third, point out that third person singular they, you know, uh, as a generic referent, has been used in English since the 1500s. Um, some of you in the chat, thank you so much, have referenced this uh, article by uh, the Dean of LSNA, Anne Crozan, published in 2021 um, in the Washington Post. The title of the article is, they has been used as a singular pronoun for centuries. Don't let anyone tell you it's wrong. Um, I That link is also going to be included in the references uh, document. You might just send them that link. Um, I, another couple of strategies here that I'm seeing in the in the in the chat is you could suggest that the person uh, that the faculty member use the graduate student's name if they're really uncomfortable using uh, pronouns. Uh, that's a great option. Another option is to to encourage the faculty member to practice at home. I mean, that's what I had to do at first, right? It, this is this is new for some of us, right? This is new for many of us, and so um, it it doesn't hurt to practice practice. Uh, was no practice is is not a bad thing and it actually helps to engender change um and that's another strategy uh one more that i see is yeah i would tell the consequence of using incorrect pronouns right uh misgendering and let the person decide how to deal with that situation great all this is great i think the most important part here is that it is it is sort of really critical and crucial to to intervene 
and to sort of have some type of intervention. Um, I think silence here um, is is really probably not uh, your best. Uh, it's not a really it's not a really recommended strategy. Um, and doing something to be sort of uh, you know both I would say reactive to the situation, but also proactively moving forward um, is sort of really encouraged. Okay, thank you so much for all those great responses. I really appreciate it. Um, okay, all right, we're at twelve forty seven here. So key takeaways. This is the last slide. The promotion of Diversity, equity, and inclusion for the trans and non-binary communities is an urgent workplace issue. We saw data on that earlier on. We should be careful when using terms such as sex and gender, and it is important to mirror the others' language when we are talking about them. Okay, we, we, we looked through the vocabulary exercise to kind of figure that out. Finally, by utilizing the recommended strategies, right, there were four in the moment strategies, plus two um, general strategies that I mentioned, as well as those that were mentioned in the chat, we can actively create a more welcoming environment among colleagues and students and a more gender inclusive cam uh, campus community. All right, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to interact with everybody. Um, I will stop uh, screen sharing and let Sarah be the Q and A. Great. great, thanks Nick. That was yeah. a great presentation, thank very you. helpful. Yep. So let's go to some Q and A. Uh, so the first question here, what can a leader do, whether you're a leader of a group, a department, a college, what can they do if their team or someone in their team are resistant to learning about gender identity and allyship? Yeah, I would say that if you're a leader, um, it's critical to put your colleagues on the path to change and on the path to success, right? Um, and part of that is offering resources, right? Uh, resources such as the ones that we've mentioned today, right? Um, uh, strategies, sort of uh, outlining those at faculty meetings, for example, um, and also, you know, developing committees, developing a working group in the department to sort of address this this topic, right? And to, and to sort of develop um, certain strategies at the departmental level that can be implemented, right? Um, but I think the critical part here is um, is that there might be some folks who are resistant, right? This is not uh, an uncommon question that I get. And the best that we can do is to avoid silence and put those colleagues, our colleagues, on the path to change and success by doing something, offering resources, workshops, uh, developing working groups, and 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 sort of engendering change moving forward. Great. Thank you. Yeah. How can we be allies and show support for someone if we don't know their stance on others speaking up for them? Yeah. Uh, this is a really good point, um, and I think it's actually a really, really critical question. I think um, ask. Uh, ask is, is really important if um, you feel comfortable doing so, and if you have, you know, a, let's say a closer relationship with, with the colleague. Um, but, you know, that, ask, that asking shouldn't just come out of the blue, right? I think if you do things that already indicate your allyship, including your pronouns in an email signature, for example, uh, including, you know, your pronouns on your door sign, serving on a DEI working group in your department, you know, your colleagues who are non-binary or trans are much more likely to assume good intent, good intent, right, in your in your question and respond authentically and honestly to your question. Great. That's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see, the next question here. Do you have any advice for cultivating gender inclusive workspace when colleagues repeatedly behave in trans exclusive ways yeah. even after education such as you know the workshop that we just heard today yeah, yeah. so um this is, this is a really good point it's a really good question and um it's something that i have reflected on a lot you know and i and i talked uh, i've talked in the past to liz gonzalez at at spectrum center and you know liz has mentioned to me that there's sort of when when thinking about the public for these types of events we have to think about the 20 60 20 uh rule 20 percent of the public probably could give the workshop better than me right 60 percent of the, of the of the public of the attendees can, are probably here to brush up and be more informed another 20 percent probably are are maybe a little bit more resistant right and maybe behaving in sort of you know trans exclusive ways right and so how can we sort of build awareness for that last 20 percent i think is what um the question is is getting at and and i think it's really important to promote empathy, right? Um, build awareness around the fact that that when we are not trans and non-binary inclusive, we are ultimately sort of stifling 
um, and not facilitating our colleagues' career satisfaction, progress, and success, right? We know that uh, members of, of marginalized communities, you know, time and time again report that they feel less respected in the workplace, that they feel less valued in the workplace. And it's really important to understand that there's a linkage between sort of those feelings and success, right? So um, building empathy, promoting empathy for those colleagues, right? Um, showing them the data that we've that that I've uh, explained today, perhaps in having them engage with some some of those quotes, for example, and sort of understanding where what their what their buy in might be, right? I think that it's very difficult. I think that very few colleagues would would disagree with the fact that we want all members of our campus community to succeed, right, and to achieve career satisfaction and to achieve uh, and to be able, and, and to do their best. Right. And so um, we also know that sort of acknowledging and, and being acknowledging identities and um, being empathic with those with all individuals is key to success. So um, sort of keeping those things in mind, I think, are, are really effective strategies for working with colleagues who might be behaving in trans exclusive ways, even after education. OK, great. Thank you. The next topic here is. Uh, this issue of why would we need to focus on our campus community? Isn't our goal to achieve inclusivity in general? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, could you speak a little bit about sure. that? Yeah, I mean, I would say you know we're we're starting, we're working. This is th this is a multi-phase project, probably of, that I will be you know, working on over the course of my career, right? But I think, you know, we do have a problem on campus, right? We know that we need to improve the culture and the outcomes for marginalized communities. And that's a starting point, right? Uh, faculty retention and career satisfaction will not happen when certain members of the community feel undervalued. And I think that's sort of where, where we're starting today. Um, same time, I think it's really important to emphasize the, the point that you know, campus culture is typically more forward thinking and visionary than society at large. And we just sort of capitalize on that point when making decisions about um, creating a more inclusive and welcoming environment, right? And you know, this is a really timely question because you know we've all been watching the news over the course of the past weeks, months, and reading some of the legislation that's come out, you know, nationally regarding trans individuals. You know, and I'm sure that um you know, being trans or non-binary, you know, it must be really demoralizing to to listen to those news, to sort of read the legislation that's coming out. I think the more that we can do on campus to create uh, an inclusive environment, the better we, the better those colleagues will be, because um, it is sort of it's an unfortunate situation that we're in, and I think what we can do on campus is to sort of make sure that we're doing our very best to be leaders for them. Yes, and striving to be the leaders in this space yeah. as our campus community. Uh, let's see. Um, can you address the use of guys, the word yeah. guys as a pronoun, uh, yeah. uh, phrases such as you guys? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that gender neutral? Well, this is sort of the age old grammatical question that we have in English regarding, you know, singular you and plural you, right? Um, and so in some speech communities, right, you know, um, you is used for both singular and plural. In other communities, y'all is more common for the plural. Um, in other communities, yous might be more common for the plural. And in others, you know, you guys is more common for the plural. Um, you know, I grew up in, in the East Coast and you guys is extremely common. It's sort of, it is sort of the default when referring to a, a group of people, right? Um, the tricky thing here, right, is that the word guy also exists independently of the sort of you guys plural, right? And it does mark gender in those instances, right? And in that sense, you know, when you say you guys, the plural isn't necessarily gender inclusive, right? And so in my own speech, I try to avoid you guys um, for that reason. Um, and I have really easily integrated y'all into my speech. I, I really like using it. Um, it, it's very effective um, and it communicates the same meaning. Um, I also was fortunate to live in, so prior to uh, moving to Ann Arbor, I worked for one year at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, and y'all is sort of the default for the plural there, differently from you guys. And I picked it up really quickly and um, it was sort of really easy for me to use. And so I, I have that advantage because I was, I have 
you know, lived in a community where doll is 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 common. But for those of you here who maybe haven't had the opportunity to live in the South or other parts of the the world where English is spoken and y'all is is common, um, feel free to to practice at home, and you'll see that it's actually not too too tricky to use in your speech. Okay, wonderful. So perhaps the last question as we sure. are getting towards the end here of our time together. Um, I know you mentioned this in the talk, but can yeah. you elaborate a bit on the estimated percentage of the non-traditional gender population on, on our campus? Sure. So in the 2021 uh, faculty climate survey, this is the faculty climate survey, um, I believe 1.6% uh, of respondents uh, responded, you know, that they were not man or woman, right? And so I think that's what we sort of have to use as a baseline. Um, that being said, I think it's also really important to acknowledge that um, there are probably individuals on campus who are still closeted. And even in, in an anonymous survey, they might not feel comfortable, you know, sort of indicating what their identity is, what their, what their gender identity is. And so um, I wouldn't be surprised if that number were higher, right? Um, and we need to do our best to make sure that those colleagues, those members of the campus community sort of feel comfortable um, opening up and coming out to us when they feel comfortable, right? Um, and the more that we can do to sort of hold these types of lectures, develop workshops or, or working groups at the, at the local level in your department, develop resources, um, indicate your pronouns on, on, on an email or on your door tag, the more that those colleagues who probably aren't indicating that they are, who are, you know, who are above that 1.6% will likely come out to us. Great. Well, thank you, Nick. Yeah. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you taking the time to be with us today and for your wonderful talk. Yeah. It's an important topic. So thanks thank so, much. so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you for the questions again. We hope you have enjoyed today's lecture, as well as other lectures in our DEI lecture series. If you miss them, you can still watch them on our YouTube channel. We will be sending out a survey, so please watch for that and fill out the survey. Give us your feedback. Thank you. Have a great day and great rest of your semester.